Welcome to Renolda Church. Take just a moment to fill out the Connect card you received when you arrived and let us know you're here and let us know how we can pray for you this week. While we're usually one church meeting in multiple locations, next Sunday we'll be one church meeting in one location. Join us for an event like no other, one great morning. On September 24th at 10 a.m., we're uniting all our campuses as one vibrant community converging at the Benton Convention Center in the heart of Winston-Salem. This gathering is a moment of unity, an unparalleled celebration where we will envision the future, embrace fellowship, and ignite the spirit of our vibrant church. Mark it on your calendar and set your sights on one great morning as together we make history. Come enjoy exciting activities and create some cherished memories. Don't miss one great morning. Again, we are so glad you're here. Let's worship together. Welcome to everybody at all our campuses. I'm so, so glad to be with you, everybody in Kernersville. God bless you. Clemens, uh, hey to everybody there and in King as well. We're so happy to be with you and to everybody joining us online. Welcome. Are you ready for some good news? In Christ Jesus, God accepts you. God is welcoming. He's really not, as some would assume, judgmental or nitpicking. He's not hovering over you, constantly wanting to tell you everything you're doing wrong. The nature of the heart of God is that He is accepting and welcoming. That's why He came in the person of Christ, to put justice on our side by taking our penalty. He's at heart a welcoming, accepting God. And therefore, so can we be. We are in a long series on Romans, spending most of the year here, and the first uh, chapters in Romans 1 through 11 are pretty much about how we can be in right relationship with God. But now we're into chapters 12 to 16, where the focus is more on how we can be in right relationship with one another. And in this really important text, we're looking at all that God has to say through Paul's pen to us about how we can be welcoming and accepting of one another rather than judgmental. Some years ago, I got a tremendous chuckle out of uh, <clears throat> uh, reading a sermon of uh, Mark Driscoll's, who is um, quite an uh, astute Bible teacher and also quite uh, snarky and <laughs> unpredictable. And I'm gonna read this, I'm gonna read this to you. Uh, he, he was, this is what he told. He said, I had a guy come in this week as a pastor from out of state, good pastor, good guy. He's got a church of 4,000 people. He said, I learned some things just visiting with him. He was very helpful and he loves the Lord. And we're sitting there talking and he asked me, what is your position on smoking? I said, this is Driscoll saying, I said, do you, do you want my personal opinion or do you want the Bible? He said, well, what's your personal opinion? And Driscoll said, well, I'm asthmatic. I don't like cigarettes or cats, and I don't like to smoke cats. I don't like cats who smoke, and I don't like cigarettes or cats in any combination or form. I don't, okay? <laughs> and uh, then he says, uh, the man said to him, well, what's in the Bible? 
Driscoll says, well, I said, uh, cats aren't in the Bible and neither are cigarettes, so I can't outlaw either of them, though I would like to, okay? I'd like to get rid of cigarettes, cats, and country western music. If I had three wishes, that's what I'd do. No more cats, no more cigarettes, no more country western music, okay? That's what I'd ask, but, 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 but you know what? It's not in the Bible. So do I have the right to make rules about things that aren't in the Bible? I don't. Now, I'd like to, I'd like to be God and set myself on a throne and make judgments about everyone else, especially country western chain smoking cat owners, okay? But because my name isn't Jesus, I can't do that and I don't have that kind of authority or right. So, Driscoll said, here's the deal. It's not a sin, it's an issue of conscience. The man said, well, what about people that say your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and you gotta take good care of the temple? Driscoll said, well, that's a good argument, but usually those people also drink a lot of caffeine and they eat Twinkies. And you know, half their food comes out of a clown that comes through the window of their car. So there's other issues with the temple. So they have to, if they're gonna be consistent, they gotta talk about the whole thing. And uh, then Driscoll asked the man, said, well, why do you ask? And the man said, well, cause I wanna have a cigarette, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the timing, really, in comedy. And, uh, and so Driscoll says, okay, go have a cigarette, whatever, and pet a cat. It's so funny to me because what he's actually getting at here is something quite related to our text in Romans 14. And to matters of conscience, matters of nuance, things that aren't talked about in the Bible, that you could only come to an understanding by um, the context of who God is and what he said to us and how much people can differ and what's really important and what does God really care about. All of that, you see, and a little story like that wrapped up in it. And a lot of what we think is essential, we're gonna learn from Paul, from God, is that it may seem essential to us, but it's not really essential. And therefore, we need to be more accepting about that. There are some things that are absolutely essential, and on those things, we need to be firm. But what Paul's talking about in Romans 14 are how we, when we try to make things essential that aren't essential, look down upon others because they don't have the same understanding that we do, and Paul is saying here that where it doesn't, um, doesn't apply to the essentials of our salvation, that we need to have much more acceptance of, of one another. And the reason this is so, so important is because this has bearing, these truths that we look at today have bearing on all of our relationships. It might be the most important thing for parents to know. I would say if I were to just single it out and say, what's the number one mistake? I feel like I, I, I watch parents and their parents and what number one mistake is being too nitpicky. And I just want to put a big sign over everybody's door at their home. It says, lighten up, you know, um, that, you know, choose the, choose the battles, uh, uh, be accepting, be uh, welcoming, and on the things that are essential, be firm, you see. But sometimes when we, we get mixed up on that and we're just we're overbearing on everything. This, this, this chapter can say much about our relationships with our spouse, with, with others uh, that we're close with, as well as those that we only know as acquaintances. And it is powerfully important for the building up of the unity of the church of Jesus Christ. And so uh, uh, this is practical stuff about right relationships with one another that is built upon gospel truth of how God has made us right with him. And it starts with this at verse one where he's identifying what he calls the weak in faith. Verse one, for the one who's weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. So we realize here that though in these verses, uh, he doesn't use the word strong in faith, it's implied that we're talking about a weak and strong. And this will be a theme in coming verses as well as coming chapters. And what he's describing here as weak in faith, what's the, what's the issue that's at hand? Well, in the first century, most of the first Christians were Jewish and they came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. 
Their lives were changed. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. But they'd grown up their whole life with Jewish law. And one of the things central in Jewish law were dietary uh, restrictions. This was one of the ways that God set apart the Jewish people. Some of it, a lot of people think, had uh, important health benefits. Probably not a great idea back uh, in the day to just eat the worst animals that just were the scavengers, uh, birds that are scavengers and sea creatures that are scavengers and pigs that eat nothing but slop. And these things were forbidden, so maybe there's a health benefit in that. But as much as anything, this was, this was a part of a holiness code that was setting apart the Jewish people. And so you just got to imagine if you've grown up your whole life, you don't eat bacon and barbecue ribs. You, you, you're just no, a lot of things you just don't eat. It's, it's forbidden. And suddenly you're a Christian. And these Jewish Christians, um, some of them were concerned that they needed to continue in the old dietary laws. And so some of them, this is what most scholars think, had just become vegetarians, not because they wanted some vegan health benefit like people today. Um, this, is not, this, is no, this is no criticism or statement at all about modern vegetarianism. This is just some people who, because they were being surrounded in a culture where they weren't always sure if the meat had come from uh, the right place, had been prepared in a way that was kosher, um, there were restrictions about how food was to be prepared, that they just said, well, I'm just going to not eat meat at all, and that way I'll make sure I'm not eating uh, the wrong or, or ceremonially unclean meat. It's possible also, we don't know for sure, that there's something similar here to what Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians. We won't take time to look at it, but there the issue is about, is it okay to eat food that had been offered to idols? And it's sort of similar, and maybe that's going on here in Romans too, that, that in a pagan culture where people worshiped idols, they take food, sometimes they put vegetables, and sometimes they put meat. You put meat out in front of a, of a little statue. Uh, it seems crazy, you know, to us, but they take it, here you go, you got a lovely ribeye steak, and you put it out in front of, in front of, a, of a little statue of, a, of an idol. And, um, and then the, the butcher comes along, and from the marketplace, and he says, hey, I'd like to buy that from you because, you know, the idol didn't eat it. And so um, the, uh, the idol worshiper might sell that steak at a discount to the butcher who takes it to his, his marketplace, and then he sells it at a discount. And uh, the issue is, was it okay to eat food that had been first offered to an idol? Now, I personally want to know how long it had been sitting out, but uh, the issue here was more of a theological one, and there were people going, you can't eat that meat. That meat been offered to a, uh, to a demon. That's demon meat. You can't eat that. That would, that would be defiling and it would be dishonoring to God. And in Corinthians, Paul says, no, no, you're free. <laughs> Listen, beloved, you are so free. You, you, your purity has absolutely nothing to do with whether that meat had been offered to an idol. You're purified by the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone. You have been so cleansed by the work of God that you've been made holy unto God and there's nothing that can contaminate that. You need to understand your freedom, you see. But there were those that thought it was a sin to eat such meat, and Paul said, so let them have their conscience about that. And this may be part of what's going on here, but it's very, it's very similar. Uh, so what he's saying essentially is that, uh, no, it's actually fine uh, for a Christian, Jewish Christian, Gentile Christian, any Christian, to eat the bacon and have your barbecue ribs. There's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, there would be nothing wrong with you eating meat that had been offered to an idol. But he said that some who continue to believe that it is a problem, we should not dispute that and look down on them, though he calls it weak in faith. It's not quite as disparaging as probably it comes across here, He's, he's not, because his whole point is, let's don't disparage these people. But that's what he's calling weak in faith. He's calling weak in faith that place where someone has become a Christian, authentically a child of God, but has yet to come into the full enjoyment and confidence of their absolute freedom and sanctity in the Lord so that they could be free with good conscience to eat meat that they might not think was kosher. And what he's saying here is don't look down on a person like that. 
And he raises another issue in our text that's similar, and it has to do with the holy days that were honored in the life of, of Israel. It says at verse 5, one person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Now, that's a really, really important uh, verse, and the second half is especially important. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So it's amazing that Paul, who cares so much about right belief and good theology, allows this room for conscience. And to say you've got to be convinced in your own mind is to say that we don't bind another's conscience about this. And what's really interesting about this is there are other places where you see Paul absolutely adamant about such matters of freedom. So, for example, in Colossians, he says, don't let anyone tell you that you must keep a Sabbath or a new moon or a festival. And, and in Galatians, if you remember Galatians at all, he is absolutely livid at the so-called Judaizers who were trying to tell people in order to be a, a fully alive and powerful Christian, if you really want to be anointed, if you really want to be on the inside group, then you also need to keep the Old Testament rite of circumcision, all the men to be circumcised. And Paul's really mad about that. So what's the difference? Well, there, when he's talking about circumcision as a necessity for being a Christian or being a fully anointed Christian, or he's talking about in Colossians, where they're saying, if you don't keep this, then you're not really saved. He's livid about that. So as soon as it touches upon something that could take away from the gospel, then he's really mad. But that's not what's going on here in, in this in, amongst the Romans. And that's not what he's talking about here. He's just talking about people that haven't, they haven't fully developed their, their sense of freedom to the point that they feel okay about eating meat. They, they haven't come to a place where they really feel okay about not continuing to keep Sabbath days and festival days because they feel like that's what they used to do and they still should do that. And they're not saying, hey, everybody's got to do this or else you're not saved. They're not saying that. But what Paul is saying here is that these are non-essentials that maybe someone will continue to grow in their thoughts about this. Right now, maybe they're weak in their faith, but they're non-essentials. And the position of the one who is stronger in their faith in this area is to not look down upon them. Don't look down upon them. And he's saying to the one who uh, believes that it's wrong to eat meat, don't you judge the person that you see eating the meat. He's appealing to a measure of grace that surrounds the non-essential matters over which there could be much dispute. So if we go back to um, the beginning of this verse one, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. This is to say those things that are just simply disputable matters and they are not essentials of our faith, then don't waste your time disputing those things and causing division and looking down on some or judging others depending on which side you're on, whether you're in the weak or the strong, according to what he's called. And one of the things to recognize, beloved, is that with this sort of thought, line of thought about weak in faith about certain areas and strong in faith about others, we, we all are weak or strong in certain areas, aren't we? Uh, in terms of our capacity to exercise our Christian freedom. And um, it's like, that I heard someone put that, there's a line, you know, God says, and you don't go past this line, right? So the Bible doesn't say, for example, that it's wrong to drink, but it says it's wrong to be drunk. So here's this line, right? And so there might be some people that go, if I were to drink, I might drink too much, so I'm not going to drink at all. Well, we, sh we honor that, right? But the person who doesn't drink at all can't be looking down on a person who has an occasional drink. But here's this line, and some are weaker and some are stronger in that. And it's probably important that you know where you're weak and where you're strong as regards your Christian liberties. Uh, I mean, there, I, I know some areas I'm weak and some areas I'm strong. Like I, one area I'm really strong comes to telling the truth. Things like, you know, do not steal. 
I'm, I'm so strong on that. I mean, you could take me and put me in a room by myself and, and, and say there are no cameras here and nobody's going to ever know what you ever do or what you ever do once you leave this room. And I look over and there's a bag full of a million dollars cash in the corner and nobody would ever knew if I took it. They're not a, that doesn't tempt me. I have zero temptation about that whatsoever. I, if I were to take that bag out of there, if I were to take one dollar out of there, my conscience would be screaming at me so loud, it'd be so unpleasant, there's no way I could ever enjoy a single dime of it. That's the same way about telling anything that's not true. I can't stand it. I, I almost tell the truth to a fault. So that's something I'm just strong in. So you could put me into all kinds of things where I'm tempted to lie on my taxes or steal money. I'm never going to do it. I'm strong in that. But I got other areas I'm weak in. If you were to take me in a room and said, uh, you know, uh, here it is. There's a full ice cream bar here with Ghirardelli hot fudge sauce and marshmallow cream and 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 caramel sauce and whipped cream and uh, and you're just leave me in there and say, don't eat any of this. I'm weak in that area. I, I mean, if you left me alone in there for a couple hours, I'd be ice cream drunk on the floor in the corner somewhere after a while. I know you can't put me alone in a room with a Ghirardelli ice cream bar. You could put me in a room with a million dollars. I won't steal it, but I, I can't sit there. So you got to know, you know, I would have to pull back. Don't put that chocolate in front of me. I'm going to eat it. Well, well. It, 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 we're all strong and weak in some areas, so let's quit judging each other so much about it, right? Yeah, you're free to eat the meat. And, and, and maybe Paul's saying, you know, that's the position he would love to see them all eventually come into, but we're not going to sit around and dispute that like the Romans were doing. Know what you're strong in. Know what you're weak in. And sometimes you do have to pull yourself back and go, I, I'm going to have to restrain further from this. I can't go all the way up to my level of freedom about that. And that's fine. And sometimes the fact of the matter is that when you see somebody that looks like they're really strong in an area, they're actually weak in that area because the way they're talking about it all the time is revealing the fact that that's the very thing they struggle with. Many years ago, I knew a Presbyterian pastor who uh, he just kept preaching on adultery and fornication and, he was, and the congregation got sick of it and they contacted the presbytery and they said, they said we're not, he's not preaching on anything else. And so they came, they met with the pastor and they said, you need to change up your topic. And so he did a series on David and the second week he was preaching on David and Bathsheba. And it just makes you think of the famous line from Hamlet, um, which, uh, you know, says, I, I think the lady doth protest too much, methinks. You know, that sometimes the reason that we go on and on about something is because it's actually the weak area in our lives. So let's put away all of that, Paul is saying, and let's be more welcoming. This is what he says at verse 3. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For why? For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Sort of like saying, um, that's not your employee, so you don't do their review. They, they, they belong to God, and, and, and God's, God's the one in charge, so He does the review. Um, it's sort of like saying, you, you, you don't like the way that parent's parenting, but you don't correct the child. That's not your child. And He says, it, it is before His master that He stands or falls, and He'll be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The Lord's in favor of helping him to stand. Let, let the Lord work with him on this. So. You're a new Christian in the first century. You never had any teaching on diet. You never worried about the meat you're eating or not meeting, and you become Christian. And now you look at a Jewish Christian who's over there restraining and only eating vegetables, and you feel superior to them because you just think they're foolish. But if you're the Jewish Christian and you look at that other person and they're over there just feasting on bacon and barbecue and everything else, and you're like, look at them. They're just, they're just uh, they, they couldn't be pleasing to God. And, and Paul's saying, stop judging like that. These things are non-essential. You're, you're judging people for things that God does not judge them. And if God does need to judge them, then let God judge them. That's what he's saying. While Paul doesn't use the word here, he is really referring to matters of conscience. That's what he's talking about. 
Um, and if you, if you remember um, that this verse five, each one should fully be convinced in his own mind, that's the language of conscience. It is something I didn't think much about until I was doing a series on Hebrews many years ago. And in Hebrews, I came to chapter 10 and saw this verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And um, I got to thinking about what does it mean for the cleansing of the conscience? And how could a conscience be evil or not? And it led me to thinking about conscience for the first time. We don't talk about conscience much. We know we have the Holy Spirit leading us, convicting of sin. We know we learn from God's word, right and wrong. So what is, what is the conscience? In fact, Romans, Paul, early on, uses this word and brings up this concept when he was talking about how even those who have not yet had the Bible, that they still have an awareness of God, and he talks about conscience. Romans 2, 14, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. And what Paul was saying there early on in Romans was even for the Gentiles, even for people who don't have the, the Bible and they, 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 they hadn't met Jesus in person and they had, there still is something that God has wired inside of people that has a, a capacity to know right and wrong, even though we're born in sin, even though there's something about the conscience and that it is somehow evidently related to the heart. In Greek, the word for conscience um, means to know with. And in fact, that's what the word in English, conscience, that's what it means. Uh, in fact, our word conscience comes from these these, these these elements, the prefix con, which means with, and sci, S-C-I, like in the word science, and it means to know. And so literally conscience means to know with. And conscience is therefore some sort of joint knowledge. And when I think about the Hebrews passage and I think about the Romans passage, it seems like that the conscience is related to what the Bible calls the heart. So there is uh, something that we don't know that much about from the Bible, but it seems to be a mystical but real faculty that's called the conscience that serves to direct our thoughts and our actions about what is right and wrong. But that conscience, in order to be healthy and not evil, has to function together with uh, another source of knowledge. And I'm just theorizing here because it's not spelled out in Scripture, but I believe the conscience is agreeing either with the truth that's apprehended spiritually by revelation from God's Word, or the conscience is just bearing witness and joining up with that which is not from God. And so in other words, the conscience is looking for a witness, joint knowledge or something like that. And so you can have thoughts that get formed in your natural mind that are impacting your conscience, and those thoughts are not God's thoughts. They were just what we might say the flesh. Or we might say they're not necessarily totally wrong, they were just cultural. J.D. Crowley and Andrew Nacelli have written a book on conscience, and Crowley says the reason that he became interested in this neglected topic was that he was one day catching himself hesitant to step over a family member's legs in the family room. He had just returned from living in Cambodia and he was at a family gathering watching TV and he got up to get some chips and salsa and he got up to, to walk and somebody's legs were stretched out and, 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 and resting on the coffee table. He was waiting for them to move their legs and they didn't because it was just his family and they were just expecting him to just step over the legs. But he said, in Southeast Asia, no one would ever do that. It would be absolutely wrong culturally to do so. And so he was sitting there frozen. It's wrong for me to step over the, my brother's legs. Well, it wasn't wrong. It was just he's in a different context. And so conscience 
is a good gift from God, but when the conscience is only joined up and bearing witness with that which is cultural or just of the flesh or something simply by experience or even just something that a parent drilled into you but wasn't necessarily the Word of God or the truths of, of God's grace, then that is a somehow aligning with the conscience. The conscience is to know with. And the problem for us as Christians is that we come into this great freedom of being in Christ and um, we need the blood of Jesus to cleanse our consciences so that we really do know the fullness of the welcome that we've received from God and that we really do know that we belong in the presence of God. Watchman Nee wrote a lot about conscience and he said this, when conscience is unclear, one's approach to God becomes forced and is not true because he cannot fully believe that God is for him and has nothing against him. The Christian, Nee said, must not have the slightest accusation in his conscience. He must be assured that his every sin is entirely atoned by the blood of the Lord and that there now is no charge against him. And so this is much of what spiritual growth looks like, is the conscience gets cleansed and you realize that this is really who you are, child of God. And those things that previously you might not have known any freedom about, you can grow into that. But what you don't need is someone else lording it over you. So we don't bind someone else's conscience. We let the gospel work in them and we let the Lord work in their thinking. I'm not talking about essential matters. I'm talking about on these non-essentials. So someone can be doing the lesser thing or maybe even in that sense the wrong thing, but they're doing so because their conscience is telling them that, and the Lord recognizes that. They're trying to honor the Lord. No, you don't need to say, I'm not going to eat any meat, because there's a chance it would have been offered to idols, or there's a chance that it had been strangled. No, you, you don't have to do that. You're free. But if your conscience is telling you that real spirituality and honor of God is that I don't eat the meat, then we're, we're not going to bind someone's conscience about that. Not long ago, I was uh, going to the Charlotte airport, where I've been many, many times. And I was going to park for this short trip in the convenient daily parking that's right across from the airport. And when I started pulling in, I, there's a big sign up that said, reservations only. Well, this was a new thing. I didn't know about it. You have to go online ahead of time and make a reservation if you're going to get in that lot that's right across from the terminal. And so all of a sudden I had to just pull back out and go find a place to park. And time was kind of short. I hadn't planned on all of this. And uh, so I said, well, I'm going to have to go park in a long-term parking lot. Long-term two was closed. I go to pull into long-term one. I've parked there plenty of times. But they've changed the entryway. And they've repaved some things. They've done some things that were different. I finally, I got all the way out of the airport. I come back in. I go into long-term one. And I pull into long term one where it looks like, you know, this is where it says go to enter and, you know, where to get your ticket. And all of a sudden I look up and the signs is a big red X, you know, like don't come this way. Um, and it says buses only. And the person in front of me all of a sudden starts backing up. So I had to back up. I said, well, this obviously is not it. That person backs up, pulls out, goes left, pulls all the way out and I do the same. The clock is ticking and I go circle all the way back around and say, well, let me get back in the long-term one. I must've read the sign wrong. I come right back in that same way and there's that same big red X and that buses only sign and now time is going and I'm like, I can't go in here. I might be hit by a bus or something. So I pulled out again. And now I'm circled all the way back around. The clock is ticking. I'm worried about missing my flight. And I come back in and there is no other place and no other lot that's open. And I pull back in and there's that red X. And I said, this has got to be the entrance. There is no other place. And so I pulled in and stayed kind of to the left. And once I did, I pulled around and I realized, oh, that big red X was just for the right-hand lanes. And that's where the buses go, but the cars were supposed to be over here and the signs weren't clear. So I think of something like this Paul's talking about. Like, I was wrong. Twice I was wrong. 
I, I was wrong thinking I could go to the daily lot. It wasn't available because I had to make a reservation. So I was wrong about that. I didn't know. And then I pull in and the sign is just like screaming at me, wrong way. And so I could not, in good conscience, pull down there when, to the best of my knowledge, that's the wrong way. And I did it twice, and it wasn't until the third time I said, it's got to be my way. And so sometimes the conscience, which is a gift from God, is picking up lesser or even faulty information that is linked up with it, and that conscience is screaming at you, this is not the right way. Surely you can't eat meat that has not kosher or has been offered. Out. Surely you can't just say, I'm not going to keep a Sabbath day like we always did back in the day. Surely you can't. Your conscience is screaming. And what Paul is saying here is that until such time as the Lord helps them to understand their levels of freedom, do not lord over them, look down on them. And if you are the one whose conscience is screaming so loudly, don't be so quick to look at the other person who is eating meat and say, well, you're obviously not a Christian. You're obviously not spiritual enough. He's saying, stop doing all that. Of course, in the end, what he wants is for us to have, have the freedom, but have the respect of others when they're not at that same level of freedom. I've said before that a good example of conscience is uh, when, I, when I go to a sporting event, I don't mind buying the cheapest ticket and then just hoping that I'll be able to move down to a seat that somebody who had a good ticket didn't show up for. And I don't mind doing that. I've been doing that my whole life. And I mean, I'm not talking about cheating where they say you're forbidden to go in this section, but I'm just saying most sporting events, you get the bad seat and you wait and, uh, and then you move down to, to a good seat. And uh, now, you know, novices and the amateurs, they, they don't know how to do this. They either go too soon, which is a, a classic rookie mistake. You go too soon, well, the person who had the nice expensive ticket, they're just, they're just coming in at the last minute and parking in their parking place that's just right outside the Coliseum, and they're just a little bit late, and they're going to tap you on the shoulder and say, excuse me, this is my seat, son, and you're going to get up and move. So you got to give enough time for the latecomer to be seated, but you also don't want to wait too long because then all the other seat movers, they're going to move down with confidence before you and get all those good seats. So it's all about the timing. But anyway, when I go with my wife, though, she hates it. She doesn't want to move down. The thought of sitting in a seat for which she doesn't have the actual ticket bothers her too much. I'll be up there sitting in the rafters. I'm up here getting a nosebleed. And, she's, and I'm like, honey, look, there are a thousand good seats down there. We can move down right now. She's like, no, no, this, this will be fine. I'm like, oh, honey, it's, there's no law against it. No, no, let's just stay up here. I'd rather stay where we have our, our seat. So we just sit up there in those seats. I, I'm not going to bind her conscience, you know, as much as I'd like her to enjoy the same level of freedom I have about stealing somebody else's seat. We, we need to be on non-essentials more accepting. It's a wise word to parents. If you go around nitpicking all the non-essentials with your child, you're going to live a tense life, anxious. When the goal is you want them to be relaxed into learning, growing, excelling, trying new things. But there are things that are essential. And in the church family life, in the body of Christ, there are things that are absolutely essential. The, the incarnation of Christ Jesus, the God-man, the Son of God and Savior of sinners, who died in our place, who was raised on the third day, who ascended to the right hand of God the Father, who sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, the Creator God, the Redeemer, the Son, and the life-giving Spirit, the Trinity of God, and the assurance that Jesus is coming back one day to culminate all of this. These are essentials. These are absolutely essentials. There's a longer list. I could list what I think. I mean, the, 
the, the key is to be discerning from the Word of God about what is essential. I, I mean, I think, I think certain matters that are all around us in society, I, I think are, are essential to the heart of God, the sanctity of life, the covenant of marriage as God's design for the world. I, but, but there's so many things that we make to be as if they are essential and they're not. And what God is saying is, turn your eyes toward me. Look to God himself and you'll spend a lot less time looking down on others. Verses seven to 12, as we come near the end, none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live, whether we die, we're the Lord's. We, we belong to him. That's the whole focus of our lives. For to this end, verse 9, Christ died and lived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? We all stand before the judgment seat of God. It's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give account of God, of himself to God. He's not saying be scared of judgment day because it's going to be this horrifying day for you. That's not what he's saying at all. In fact, Judgment Day for the Christian is going to be wonderful. It's going to be a celebration of the unmerited favor of God that's been given to you through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But what he's saying is that you're not the one that sits in the judgment seat ever. That's God. You're not in a position to condemn. You're not in a position to bind someone else's conscience. So even in the Old Testament the era of the law, it's interesting that God didn't spell out every single little detail, did he? You wonder why. He said, don't work on the Sabbath, but it was the rabbis that added 39 laws about what it means not to work on the Sabbath. Because as soon as you say, well, don't work on the Sabbath, well, what does that mean? Don't walk on the Sabbath. Well, how far? Well, what, what? You see, I think maybe God didn't spell out every little detail for us ever, even in the covenant of the law. Why? Because it's not his heart. He, he's not a nitpicking, judgmental God. He's holy. He's perfect and righteous. But his heart towards us, and this is why he came in Jesus, is to be welcoming. So, I take us back to verse 3. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. He has welcomed you. If you've not yet met Jesus, and you wonder what is his heart towards you, with all the things that he could find fault with you, I'll tell you his heart, he's welcoming. He is ready for you. That's why he came in the person of Jesus. And if you're a Christian, no matter how long you have been, and you wonder about all the different areas of your life that still need changing, he's a teacher and he'll help you, but he's welcoming. He is accepting. And therefore, so can we be. And that's the gospel.